Hey folks, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game. But today, it's a little bit more than that for me. See, today, I finally have a use for my college degree. Now, I've always wanted to be in entertainment, but I didn't want to study acting in college because I'd already been doing that on my own for years. So instead, I majored in religious studies. This is true. Here's my diploma as proof. You know, with some details redacted for privacy, you don't get to know how old I am. Now, I'm not religious at all, but what I've always found fascinating is the mythology and lore of religion. And virtually all religions throughout history have had some tradition of storytelling. And whether it's to impart wisdom, teach morality, or inspire devotion, these stories forge a lasting impression on the people who hear them, sometimes even surviving beyond the religion itself, with easy examples of this being Greek, Egyptian, and Norse mythology. Now, you'd be hard-pressed to find a worshiper of Zeus or Ra these days, but I'm pretty sure you can think of a few board games where Odin or Thor plays a pivotal role. So that's why I find it interesting that the mythology of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, of which there are some very interesting and well-known stories, don't show up in this space that often. But today we're going to be learning Deliverance, which aims to change that. This is a campaign RPG in a box that uses biblical mythology and tradition as inspiration for its modern-day setting. There's angels, demons, and the devil himself. So if you want to be able to protect yourself and others from eternal damnation in the game anyway, we got to learn how to play. Now before we dive in, I do have a few important things to mention. First off, this video is sponsored by the publisher, Lowen Games, so big thank you to them. Second, they'll be checking my work, and so I don't expect there to be any mistakes, but just in case, please turn on the Klingon Subtitles channel, because that's where I'll post any corrections. And don't worry, they won't actually be in Klingon. And lastly, if you want to watch some actual gameplay of Deliverance, I've got a separate video over on Rado's channel where I show just that. Anyway, let's get to the game. In Deliverance, you and your friends will play as a squad of angels sent to a small, unassuming town that, for some reason, is just lousy with demons. You'll fight enemies that range from the annoying to the bizarre to the truly fearsome. Each angel has unique divine powers that grow in strength as the game goes on, and they'll be put to the test in two different game modes. You've got the skirmish mode, which is a standalone game wherein you'll fight a randomly selected wave of demons, followed by a powerful demon prince, but there's also a campaign mode where you'll play through 14 handcrafted missions. I'm going to start by teaching the skirmish mode, which will cover most of the gameplay, and then we'll end with a campaign and see how it changes things around. So let's set things up. The instructions are pretty easy to follow in the manual, so I'm going to breeze through this a bit. You might have this cool playmat, but in case you don't, I'll be showing off the game without it. It's pretty much the same. You'll have a map with one city tile per player, placed however you like, so long as they're all adjacent to each other, and a heavenly gates tile, which is like home base for you and holds these prayer and treasure cards. You've also got this darkness board, which will track enemies and hold darkness cards, which are universally bad for you. You'll draw a battle card for each map tile, so place the matching standees and these saint tokens on the designated Hebrew letters, and then grab their demon boards and place them nearby. As for you, you'll choose any of these angels to play as, and each comes with three levels of talent cards, which will be unlocked as you level up. You'll get some action and courage tokens, and you'll place your angel mini on one of the heavenly gate spaces. And lastly, there's a tray full of bits and bobs that you'll keep nearby. There are also ways to increase the difficulty, which would change setup a bit, but I'll talk more about all that later. And once you're done setting up, it's time to get fighting. Gameplay happens in three phases. First is the darkness phase, where you'll add darkness cards face down, flipping them over and applying their horrible effects if the track gets filled up. Next, you'll take actions, alternating between one angel and one demon until all players and NPCs have taken a turn. And if you earn enough XP during the round, you'll end with a level up phase, choosing either talents, which will grant new active or passive abilities, or treasure, which increases your stats and sometimes gives a bonus or mild penalty. Once all the demons are defeated, you'll prepare the final battle, adding more map tiles, demons, and a fallen prince, all of which you'll have to take down in order to win. However, if all angels are defeated in battle, the demons will be the ones to emerge victorious. So let's get to the rules and figure out how we're going to avoid that. Alright, so as I mentioned, the phases of a round go darkness, actions, and leveling up. But in the first round of play, the darkness phase is almost non-existent, so I'm going to skip it for now. Just know that there will be a few face-down cards in this track from the get-go. Anyway, let's talk about actions. These will alternate between Angel and Demon, with each character taking all of their actions before switching off. 
For players, you'll choose who takes the first turn, and then when it gets back to you, proceed in clockwise order. For demons, they'll have an initiative track and will take turns in that order, flipping their token when they've completed their turn. So let's look at the player's actions first. Each angel has a player board, and this tells you what actions they can take, it holds your two action tokens, which you'll ready at the beginning of this phase, and it lists their four stats, health, strength, discipline, and wisdom. You'll also start with two courage, which is a resource that is both generated by and fuels your actions. On your turn, you can take two main actions, denoted by this normal hourglass, flipping a token over after each one. You can also take any number of free actions you have access to, shown by these winged hourglasses. Each character has at least one action that is free the first time you use it, but costs an action for each repeated use. And sometimes actions will have conditions that make them free, so keep an eye out for that. Now let's say John Hamm, I mean Gabriel here, wants to attack this imp. His flight ability lets him move a number of spaces equal to his hammer value, which is three. So now we're right up next to the imp, and since that was the first time we've taken the flight action, it was free, and we still have two actions left. We'll probably want to stab the imp next, and this action has a bit more info, so let's break it all down. First we look at the range, which in this case is 1, meaning the imp needs to be 1 space away. This game uses orthogonal adjacency, so only these spaces would qualify. The imp is within our range, so we can take the action. You complete each action top to bottom, left to right, so we flip an action token, gain 1 courage, and then start reading text. It says we deal book damage, which in this case is 1, so we place 1 damage token onto the matching 2 space of the imp's board. And then if we have 0 shields, which is true here, we would gain 1. I'll talk about shields in a bit. Now that we've finished that action, we can take another. We have enough courage to do the field medic or shield discus abilities, so let's do the shield discus and finish off this imp. It's another free action, but we have to spend the 2 courage to use it. Its range is 3, and the imp is well within that, so we deal our hammer's worth of damage, which technically is enough to kill this imp, but for the sake of example, let's say we're still one shy. The second part of this action is to make a test. Lots of things will ask you to make tests in this game, and it always involves you rolling two dice and trying to meet or exceed the target number, in this case 7. Let's say we do, which means we deal an extra damage, and now the imp is well and truly toast. We remove all the damage counters, as well as the imp itself, and then we gain one experience, as shown on the imp board. XP is shared between angels, because kill stealing is outlawed in heaven, so we all use this one XP track. Going back to Gabriel, that shield discus was another free action on its first use, so we still have one more, and let's use it to pray. Unlike all the other actions, which are unique to each angel, prayer is something that everyone has access to. When you pray, you'll gain a courage and then draw a prayer card. These are powerful one-time use abilities that can be actions, free actions, or interrupts, which, as it says, you can play at any time. After drawing the card, test 7, and if you succeed, you can either cast down a darkness card, remove an affliction, or revive a defeated angel, all of which I'll talk more about later. After praying, Gabe here is out of action tokens, but could still use his field medic ability since it's a free action. That would cost some courage though, so we decide to end our turn and pass it over to the demons. Before we get to how they work, I'm going to talk more about the nitty gritty of movement and combat, uh, but really quickly before I do that, since we've now mentioned all of them, you can only have a maximum of 5 prayer cards, courage, and shields at any given time. If you would draw a 6th prayer card, you must either play one if it's an interrupt, or just discard one. So let's take a closer look at movement. For the most part it's pretty straightforward. You can only move orthogonally, and these blue lines block movement, so you have to go around them. You can move through other angels or demons, but you can't end your movement on the same space. If you would end on the same space, which might happen if you're forced to move a specific amount of spaces, you then fall back to the space you came from. There are also these saint tokens on the board, and interacting with them will be a big part of gameplay. You can move through and even end your movement on their space, and doing so will often be desirable. If a saint is on its blue side, it is considered oppressed, which is not something you want. By moving on or adjacent to a saint, you can flip it to its protected side. That is, unless a demon is already on or adjacent to it. When you have this kind of conflicted influence, the saint stays on whichever side it was on, good or bad. But as soon as only one angel or demon is on or next to the saint, it will flip to the appropriate side. You want to protect saints for two reasons. First, every time you flip a saint to protect it, you gain 1 XP. The other benefit has to do with darkness cards though, so I'll talk more about that later. Now, a good way to protect these saints is to defeat the demons in their area. 
We've already seen most of how combat works, but there are a couple quick things to mention. Range is counted the same way as movement, so if you have a range to attack, it could affect these spaces. This holds true when dealing with corners or those blue barriers we saw, meaning that being separated by a barrier means you're not considered adjacent, but if you have the range, you can curve your bullet around the barrier no problem. Sometimes skills will show an asterisk next to the range, let you target multiple opponents, or have other benefits or restrictions, but these will always tell you whatever you need to know in the description of the skill. Now, when you deal or take damage, add the matching number of damage tokens. But if the target has shields, those reduce the total damage taken by their amount before being discarded. So a 3 attack versus 2 shields would only deal 1 damage. If you deal enough damage to kill a demon, great, you get some XP for that. If you take enough damage to meet your health value, well, that's a bit less fortunate. If this happens, your angel is defeated, but you're not out of the game just yet. Take your figure off the map and remove all status effects from your character, but keep everything else as it is, including your damage. While defeated, you're immune to pretty much anything that happens. You'll still take turns, but you can only use prayer cards or the prey action. You'll need to be revived before you can get back in the fight, so any healing abilities that other players have can't affect you. However, anyone, including you, can revive you using the prey action like we talked about before. When this happens, remove one damage token and place your angel on any space of the Heavenly Gates tile. Just don't take too long doing this, because if all angels are defeated at the same time, you'll lose the game. Now, before we get to how the demons work, let's talk status effects. These can be applied to both you and the demons, and can do all kinds of things, both good and bad. Unless otherwise stated, you can only have one of each effect at a time, and they'll last until they're removed, either by some ability or at the start of the final battle. There's a cheat sheet for them, but very quickly, Blessed will heal you one damage every time you pass a test, Cursed deals one damage every time you fail a test, Empower increases the damage you deal by one every time you deal damage, meaning that if you have prayer cards or talents that deal extra damage after an attack, that'll also be increased. Swift does the same thing, but for movement, so each move ability you have, no matter who it moves, can go one space further. Root makes it so that the next time you move, no you didn't, and then it gets discarded. And Wither makes you take a damage every time you end your turn. There's also Light and Shadow, which affect spaces on the map. If an angel ends its turn on one of these, they either heal or take one damage respectively. Abilities that remove boons or afflictions can remove Light and Shadows regardless of where they are on the board, and if you would place a light or shadow where its opposite already exists, just flip the tile. All right, now that's all done, let's see how the evildoers do their evil. While there are often multiple demons, they're not all gonna take individual turns. Instead, each demon of a type takes a turn together before passing back to the angels. When this happens, you follow their board from top to bottom, though depending on your difficulty level, they may have a talent card or two. Besides adding a little bit of health, these add abilities that trigger before anything else. So let's say those imps we're facing aren't just meddlesome, they're also sadistic and on fire. Fantastic. The sadistic talent is ongoing, as shown by its symbol, so we'll keep that in mind when we perform the immolated effect. Each imp will move one space towards the nearest target, and if they get up next to any angels, deal them two damage. One for the immolation, the other for the sadism. Demons follow almost all the same movement rules as angels, with one exception. If a demon moves towards an angel and ends up in their space, they'll try to surround their target, meaning that if the space they came through already had a demon, they'll move to a different adjacent space, even if they didn't have enough movement to actually get there. If the target is already surrounded, the nearest demon will fall back and give up their space to the active demon. So, once we're done with the talents, we go down the rest of the list. Meddling imps are meddlesome, so they heal all their damage, rude, and then we roll a die for their main action. This one roll will determine what all of the imps do, so find that out, and then have each imp follow the instructions in numerical order. Most of these are self-explanatory, but one thing that you'll see a lot is demons engaging a target. This means that they choose their target first, and then move only as far as they need to to get into range. If they were already in range, they won't move at all. Oh, and if you ever have a tie between two targets, or any situation that has two equal options, the players get to decide the outcome. Now when the last demon of a type is defeated, you remove their initiative card from the row and slide in any remaining demons, meaning that they'll go sooner. It's also possible that you'll add new demons to the map during play. If this is the same type as a demon already on the board, just have it act as normal with its buddies. 
but if it's a new demon type, their card is placed at the end of the initiative track and starts out exhausted, meaning that they won't take a turn this round. Place the action marker on its gray side to show this. Once a new round starts, they'll be in play though, and this could mean that there are more demon types than angels. If this is the case, after all the angels have taken turns, the remaining demons will get to go one after another until they've all acted. It's also possible for a demon to receive an action outside of its turn, most likely from a demon prince. If this happens, roll a die and take the extra action immediately before continuing with whatever else was going on. So that's pretty much all there is to know about the action phase, and after a round or two, you'll probably have enough experience to level up. So let's talk about that next. As you might have guessed, leveling up is a big deal in this game. So how are we going to do that? We've seen that you gain experience every time you defeat a demon and protect a saint. The XP is shared, so if you gain enough XP to meet or exceed your target amount, which is 1 plus the number of angels, so in this case 3, you'll be eligible to level up during the level up phase. When this happens, spend the necessary XP, and then each player chooses to either gain a heavenly treasure or a talent. Treasures will increase your stats by 1 for each matching symbol, and might provide some other boon. These can be an immediate effect, an ongoing benefit, or a new action that you can take some of which are one-time use only. Of course, some of them also have penalties, so be aware of that. Talents don't boost your stats, but they do offer powerful effects that are unique to your angel. These often combo well together, so getting a few talents can really supercharge your character. Whenever you gain either treasure or a talent, you draw two cards and choose one to keep. You can hold up to five treasures, and the type doesn't matter in this game mode, so you can totally put a hat on a hat. On a hat. Talents, however, have three specific slots, one for each level, and each time you choose to level up talents, you draw from the lowest level available. Usually, this means you can only level up talents three times, but there are some disposable abilities, which would leave an opening that you could then fill again. So, after leveling up, or if you've skipped that phase because you didn't have enough XP, you start a new round with that darkness phase we skipped earlier. At the beginning of each round, including the first one, you have a darkness phase. The purpose of this is to fill your darkness board with cards that all have the goal of ruining your day. This happens in four steps. First, for each player, you place one card face down on the next open slot. Then, if this is the first round, you'll skip the rest and go right to the action phase. But if not, you'll go to the next step, adding another card for each oppressed saint on the map. Now, This might lead to you needing to place a card when no slots remain. If this is the case, for each card you can't place, flip a card instead. These may have effects, but they'll trigger after you're done flipping. Or if the row is full of face-up cards, for each card you would flip and can't, deal one damage to each angel. So yeah, this board is nothing but bad, but remember, you can use prayer to cast down these cards, which sends them to the discard pile, whether they were face-up or face-down. Anyway, once you've finished adding and flipping cards, go through them left to right and apply the effects of each card with a lightning bolt. If they only have this symbol, they'll be discarded after activating, but if they also have the ongoing icon, they'll stay in play and trigger every round until removed. Some cards only have the ongoing icon, and these will affect you in various ways during the game, but don't have any specific effect at this time. After all that, you'll start the next action phase, flipping everyone's action tokens to their ready position and choosing an angel to be the first player. So, with all that in mind, let's say we've defeated the first wave of enemies and it's time for the final battle. As soon as this happens, even if it's in the middle of a player's turn, the round will end and you'll start setting up for Act 2. First, you remove all status effects, both good and bad, from the characters and the map. Then discard any face-down darkness cards, keeping the face-up ones, and remove any saint tokens from the map, but keep the angels where they are. After that, for each unused action token that each angel has remaining, they get to do one of the following. Gain a courage, cast down a face-up darkness card, heal three damage, or gain a prayer card. Then the angels get to level up once for free, and if you have enough XP to gain a level, spend it as normal and level up again. Once you've done all that, it's time to bring in the baddies. This is similar to the initial setup where you'll add a new map tile for each angel and then draw a battle card for each new map tile. However, the last card you draw won't be a regular demon. Instead, you'll pull from the Fallen Prince deck. And these guys are not messing around. They have punishing abilities and sometimes even take multiple actions, or in the case of the frogs, have multiple figures. 
They also have a lot more health than your average demonic underling, and this health changes based on how many players you have, so add the amount of health shown on the board matching your player count. On top of that, they have their own set of five unique darkness cards. These have a number of stars on each card and must be stacked in order, randomizing sets of cards with the same value. During the first darkness phase of the final battle, draw one of these prince cards instead of the first darkness card. These cards always start face up, and if there's no space for them, they'll displace a face down card if possible, or any face up card if not. If this happens, each angel takes one damage per discarded card. Also, because the prince cards are placed face up, if it has a lightning bolt, this will trigger immediately. And one last thing about prince cards, they often have this stronghold symbol, which means that they can't be cast down, so you're stuck with them until you lose by all angels being defeated at the same time, or you win by defeating the prince and all of the other demons. Now that's just about it for the skirmish mode, but there are a couple gameplay variants to talk about. First off, you might want to increase the difficulty of the game. There are five different levels you can play with. First is Adventure, where you don't adjust anything, and then Heroic, Nightmare, Abyssal, and Infernal. Sounds lovely. For each of these higher difficulty levels, you'll be giving every demon either minor or major talents. I briefly mentioned these before, but again, these are new abilities or ongoing effects that will enhance the deadliness of your foes and increase their total health. When demons take their turn, any talents with immediate effects trigger first before moving on to what's written on their board. The princes get these too, but theirs are picked from their personal deck of talents that are tailored to them, much like your talents are tailored to you. Now, to balance all this out, each angel will also get to level up one to three times depending on the difficulty. And if you want the specific amounts of levels and talents applied, just check this part of the rulebook. The other big variant is solo play. Now, if you want to, you can just control two angels, and I can say from experience that that works out pretty well, but there's also a dedicated solo option whereby you have just one angel on the board with a little help from on high. In this mode, you'll set up for a two-player game, but instead of a second angel, you'll have the Intercessor, who doesn't have a figure, but does have the skinny board and a set of talent cards. They'll have a turn pretty much exactly like if they were a player, but with you controlling their actions and benefiting from everything they do. Now, because you're the only angel on the map, there are a couple changes to gameplay. Any ability you use that targets other angels can target you instead, but these effects only apply once per turn, so this wouldn't double up, for example. And also, God helps those who help themselves, so if you get knocked out, that intercessor isn't lifting a finger. The only way you wouldn't immediately lose in that situation is if you have a prayer card or skill that can revive as an interrupt, which you'll need to play immediately following normal revival rules. And with that, we know all we need to know to play Deliverance in Skirmish Mode. If that's what you came for, feel free to stop here and jump into the game. But there's also a campaign mode that you might be interested in, and it changes things up in a few important ways. So if you're sticking around, let's take a look at that next. All right, so the campaign of this game has your group of angels investigating the town of Fallbrook, a completely normal and inconspicuous neighborhood, save for the fact that it's just filthy with demons. You'll play through 14 missions, with the option to revisit missions again in a special challenge mode, and there's a secret mystery box that I'll let you discover on your own. Now, for the most part, this plays the same as the skirmish mode, but there are a few key differences, so we'll talk about all of those. Oh, and I guess I should give a very minor spoiler alert for the first two missions, which I'll be using as examples. So, setting up the game is one of the first big changes, because as opposed to doing this randomly, you'll follow instructions in the campaign book. These will show you the specific map tiles and their orientations, as well as which demons you'll be using and their order on the initiative track. The rings around these demons correspond to your player count. If you have at least the number of red marks in players, place that demon on the map. So a three-player game would include all of these, but not these other ones. Usually you'll use the standard demons and princes, but for some missions you'll encounter dangerous lieutenants, upgraded versions of the basic demons. Place the campaign book nearby to use as their demon board, and use the standees that most closely resemble the portrait, so Og here would use an abomination standee. Lieutenants are not quite as strong as princes, but they do still increase their health based on player count. On top of the demons and map placement, if there are any other setup instructions, you'll find them in this blue box that each mission has. 
This will also tell you the victory conditions, which will often be to just destroy all demons, but other times will offer you alternative ways to win. And if there are any other special rules, like how you skip the darkness phase on the first two missions, this will also be shown here. Now, in my opinion, the biggest change in gameplay is how experience works. In the skirmish mode, you're tracking XP and leveling up during the game, but for the campaign, you don't power up quite so quickly. Instead, you'll gain the list of rewards after successfully completing a mission. The first mission just unlocks your first talent slot, but after that, you'll be gaining XP, which you'll spend on your angel's character sheet. Each point of XP fills in one of these circles, and these can earn you talents or other bonuses. Once you've completely filled all the circles next to a talent or bonus, you'll have access to it for the rest of the campaign. Bonuses can improve your setup or grant permanent boosts to courage, test rolls, or stats, and they can be unlocked in any order. But for talents, you need to go from left to right for each slot. However, when you unlock a talent, instead of drafting a couple talent cards and choosing one, you now have access to every talent card of that level. You just have to pick one to fill the slot during the setup of a mission. Each slot can still only hold one talent though, so if you've unlocked level 3 in the first slot, you're probably going to be placing just a level 3 talent there. But this also means that if you completely fill these tracks, you can have 3 level 3 talents, which would make you pretty dang strong. As for treasures, these will be rewarded periodically throughout the campaign, and will designate a specific type of item for you to get. Each player will reveal cards until they have two options of the matching type, then pick one and write it down. This item will be with you for the rest of the campaign. Oh, and if it has an immediate effect, that triggers during setup of each mission. Now, if you're playing the campaign in solo mode, you still use the intercessor, and during gameplay, it works just the same. You don't use a second character sheet because the only way the intercessor gets stronger is by unlocking talent slots, which it does whenever you unlock your own. You don't have to use the same level talents when choosing your loadout though, so once you've unlocked these slots, you can mix and match as you see fit. So that's all setting you up pretty well, but the campaign will get harder as you go, and there's a chance you might not succeed. If that's the case, instead of marking victory on your campaign sheet, place a mark in the favor box. You can't do this on the first mission, but that's a tutorial, so you should be able to beat it. Anyway, you need to beat a mission to progress in the campaign. So for each favor you've accumulated in a mission, each angel will start that mission with a prayer card, which will hopefully set you up for success. Another way to help you get stronger is to attempt a challenge. These are optional, and you have to choose to do them during setup. They'll make the mission significantly harder, usually by adding specific talents to your opponents, shown below in red. But if you succeed, you'll gain an XP. You can attempt a challenge the first time you try a mission, in which case that bonus gets added to the other experience you earn, but what's usually recommended is for you to revisit old missions, which you can do at any time, and try them again with the challenge added. You won't get the normal XP for completing that mission, just the bonus, but that adds up, and can make a big difference for the later missions, which can get pretty tough. Oh, also, challenge missions don't get to use favor at the start, or earn any favor if you fail. And with that, you now know how to play Deliverance in both skirmish and campaign mode. Thanks again to Lowen Games for sponsoring this video, and I hope you all liked it and are looking forward to getting this game to the table. Either way, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!